Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll give everyone a minute to join the webinar and then we will get started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I wanna be mindful of everyone's Saturday morning. Um, thank you for spending some time with us uh, this morning. My name is Natalie Alcorta and I'm with Age of Central Texas. We are a regional nonprofit um, and we, have, we serve the Williamson County, Travis, Bastrop and Hayes County. Um, but if you are in another county, you can still just give us a call and we will help. Um, we, uh, so thank you for joining us this morning. We have a wonderful presentation of ahead of us. Um, just a quick, uh, just some quick points to, to talk about. Um, if you have a question throughout the discussion, please drop your questions in the chat box. It's a little, um, you'll find the chat box down at the bottom of your screen and it says chat. You can just pick click on that, drop your question in, and at the end of the discussion, we will get to your question. And if we do not get to your question um, due to time, then uh, we will reach out to you individually after the presentation. Um, so again, if you have a question, drop it in the chat box. Um, and I want to welcome VC and Keith with us this morning. And I would love to hand it off to you to, to give your your introductions and share a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Natalie. Um, we, we appreciate you having us on today to, uh, to talk to everybody about the myths uh, surrounding Medicaid. Uh, my, just by way of introduction, uh, my name is Keith Ludi. I'm an attorney and partner with the law firm of Barnett and Ludi here in Austin, Texas. And VC Spear, who's uh, my uh, legal assistant, is uh, our resident Medicaid expert and probably knows more about Medicaid than just about anybody that you'll ever meet. So um, over, over the time that we have this morning, we're going to kind of outline some things about Medicaid that we've encountered people come into our law offices to talk about uh, the potential of getting on Medicaid. And many things are there, we, we call it the Medicaid myths. It's what people come in believing that's just not true. Um, so, uh, VC, I guess I, I would start with just kind of beginning with what is, what is the biggest myth? I know that there's a lot of them we're going to go through, but is there, is there one to you that just stands out that people walk in more than any other time and, and are misunderstanding about Medicaid? I think probably it's that they have to spend all their money to be able to participate in the Medicaid program. Yeah. I, I think I've, see, I've seen that as well. Uh, for, for those not familiar with Medicaid, just to start at the very beginning, uh, we get many people who confuse Medicare with Medicaid uh, because they sound so much alike, but they're two different things. VC, can we start just with, with you know, the very first step? What is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Yes, Medicare is a federal program a, a medical program that you become eligible for when you become 65, or you can access the program sooner if you become disabled before the age of 65. You can also have the Medicare program. Medicaid program is a state program, and that program was ideally uh, organized and provided for people that must have 24 hour care. And usually the care is in a nursing facility, a skilled nursing facility, and that provides 24 hour care to um, usually uh, seniors, but it can be individuals that have other illnesses or become disabled from other um, illnesses or accidents or something like that but that's the primary difference between the two. 
Okay. And I, I failed to say when I when I said VCs are resident Medicaid expert, just <laughs> so you guys know why why I'm saying that. VC actually worked for Medicaid, Texas Medicaid, for 20 years in in policy and management, so very upper levels, and has spent the last 11 years uh, helping people to obtain Medicare uh, Medicaid. See, I'm I'm doing it myself. Medicaid benefits. <laughs> Uh, so she's got 31 years of knowledge and Medicaid. I've talked to many people before about it, that Medicaid, getting on Medicaid is a little bit like walking through a minefield. And if you, if you take the wrong step at the wrong time, and uh, you, can, you can suddenly be uh, back to the beginning of the process. And so if you have somebody like BC to help you get through that, it's, it's very useful. Um, so... When it comes to Medicaid, I think that the biggest, let's, let's address the biggest myth that you, that you brought up is people will come in and they'll say, I have too much money, I can't qualify for Medicaid. Um, to, to begin to address that question, I think it's important if we uh, talk about the role that Medicaid plays. So take your average person uh, or, or married couple um, and let's say that they have, they own a house, and they've been saving their money uh, all of their life. They have a, a nest egg of money and maybe it's you know, 100,000, 200,000, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, but that's kind of typical of what we'll see. And they have that money invested. Uh, they have some in the bank, they have it put aside. And then many of them will have a house. Uh, and if they're of retirement age, there's a good chance that their house is paid off. So they've got full equity in the house. So under my uh, hypothetical scenario, I'm gonna say that we have a married couple with $200,000 in the bank and in investments, along with a $300,000 house. That means that their equity, if you will, um, their assets are worth about $500,000. And the question is, as they begin to age and need more care, how are they gonna pay for it? Um, for some people, the answer is that they plan to go to assisted living and then if they need to, to a skilled nursing facility and just pay out of pocket, they figure, well, we've got $500,000 here. That should last us, we hope. But when you start doing the calculations, uh, skilled nursing in, uh, in Central Texas can run anywhere between seven and $9,000 a month for an individual. So that's about $100,000 a year and if you have $500,000, it seems like a lot of money, but it can be gone in five years. Medicaid is a program, as VC mentioned, that is both federal and state. Um, the feds pay 60% and state pays 40%. That fills the gap between what your income level is and what your needs are to stay in a skilled nursing facility. So if a, if a person had an income of $3,000 per month, and they needed $9,000 per month to stay in a skilled nursing facility, if they qualify for Medicaid, Medicaid makes up that difference uh, between the $3,000 that they have per month and the $9,000 that they need. And so that's the benefit of it, is if a person qualifies for Medicaid, they're not spending down their, their nest egg. Now they are spending their monthly income on their care, but they can save that nest egg for other things, uh, including the ability to pass it on to their children and grandchildren when, when they die. So, um, so back to my, now that I've said that, back to the beginning um, premise of, well, I have too much money to qualify. Yes, you do, but there are ways uh, that under the Medicaid rules that we can, we can fix that. Um, Medicaid's rules say that an individual, in order to qualify, there's a few things that, that have to be true. First of all, they must need, they must be at that point in life where physically they need to be in a skilled nursing facility. Second of all, Medicaid says that an individual's assets cannot be, uh, non-exempt assets cannot be more than $2,000. And for a married couple, those non-exempt assets cannot exceed $3,000. Well, you can see that this is a problem. Um, if a person owns a house, by the way, that is, that is considered an exempt uh, item. When, uh, 
so under my scenario here, if we've got a married couple with a $300,000 house that's paid off and 200,000 in the bank, they are $298,000 um, or 197 married couple above what Medicaid would allow before they could, they could qualify for Medicaid. So if that married couple, one of them needed Medicaid, Medicaid would say, come back after you've spent $197,000 and then we will consider uh, putting you on Medicaid program. Um, and, and VC, I think you'd, you'd probably agree. We, we see this quite often uh, when people are in that scenario and their, their plan is just, we're just gonna spend it down and pay out of pocket until we're broke, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so the, the things that are allowable under the, under the Medicaid rules is there's a way to take that extra money and shelter it. And there are different strategies, legal strategies to be able to do that. Um, I'll start with the one that we don't use that I think is a, is a terrible idea. One is um, for somebody to take that extra money and turn it into a long-term annuity, uh, which if you're not familiar with annuities, it's like taking a lake and turning it into a river. Instead of being an asset, uh, it becomes an income stream. And typically with that much money, people would stretch it out um, over the course of 10 or 15 or even 20 years. And the reason that that is a bad idea is that money becomes locked up and basically inaccessible without penalty. So we find that a much better strategy is the use of trusts. Um, in particular, there's something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust or an irrevocable trust that we can create here in the law office and transfer those extra funds into the trust so that Medicaid will not count them. Um, now, before you think, well, that sounds great, let's do it tomorrow, there, there's a little qualifier to it. Um, that is that Medicaid has a five-year look back on any asset transfers. So ideally, we will speak to people who are not needing Medicaid immediately uh, we'll, we'll talk to them five years and, and a month before they actually need it. We can make these transfers into a trust. And at the end of the five years, 100% of what's in that trust is becomes invisible or not countable by Medicaid under the Medicaid rules. More frequently, we get people who will come to us and, and they either they, they're hoping to make it five years, but then they don't or they're saying, look, we can already tell you our, our loved one needs to go into Medicaid bed next month. So under that scenario, there's still a benefit in that the uh, money that's put into the irrevocable trust uh, from the time that it's put in, about 60% of it roughly uh, is invisible uh, from the first day. So even under a worst case scenario, we can, we can preserve and protect about 60% of those funds from having to be spent down. So, okay, uh, VC, tell us another, another Medicaid myth. Okay, um, sometimes when there's a couple and one needs to go into a Medicaid facility, uh, they feel that they have to spend down the spouse half of the asset and to, to become eligible for the Medicaid program. Okay, and, and um, tell us about that. I know, I know that there's an acronym that goes with it. And yes. I, I always forget what the acronym stands for, but I know the, the acronym <laughs> is, is SPRA. I, I know you're talking about the SPRA, the rules regarding SPRA. So tell us how that works. Okay, the SPRA is the spousal uh, well, now I've had it. Um, <laughs> let's see. It's the spousal resource, uh, the, the spousal resource al allowance. And, uh, and that changes uh, every, usually every buy in them when the uh, legislature meets, they change that limit. And currently the maximum spousal resource allowance is $130,380. Now, what that means is if you had uh, 
$500,000, then what, what Medicaid looks at is that each of you have 250,000. So your ideal is to uh, reduce the spouse that wants the Medicaid or needs the Medicaid benefit has to be reduced to below $2,000. So um, policy allows us to do some, uh, some Medicaid qualifying annuities and we do that frequently with our clients, but they're not a lifetime annuity. What we do is we tie up the money and what we would do is the 250,000 that belongs to the, uh, the spouse that's going in, you can actually do a transfer of those assets to the spouse that remains in the community. And the way we do that, we spin down their 250,000 and then we have to, the other uh, spouse that's not going in can have 130,000. So what we look at is uh, adding to the 250,000, the above the 130 that's already protected for the community spouse, we add the difference. The other uh, from the 250, we would take the 120,000 that's over and above the protected amount and purchase a two month annuity. My, sometimes it's six months depending on the values, but we would purchase a short term annuity, which means we transfer all of the assets back to the community spouse. And at that time, after the Medicaid is done, you can, the uh, community spouse can set up and uh, um, can set up a Medicaid trust and then start the five year look back for himself or herself. So it's kind of a, a complicated issue, but, uh, but we follow the policy that the state allows and we can certainly help you to, to uh, save as many of the assets as possible. Now I have, uh, and I have a little scenario for uh, an individual that had uh, $310,000 and uh, she needed Medicaid right now. So what happened is that uh, we transferred the assets into a trust for her and uh, she had a social security check of $950 a month. So she was quite a bit short of like the 7,000 that it was gonna take to pay for her care. And, uh, and then what we were able to do was to pay the difference she had a, uh, 300, she had a $3,000 long-term care policy, which that still was not enough to pay the private pay for the $6,000 her care was gonna cost. So we set up an annuity for an individual to give her another check for $2,300 each month to help her pay her 6,000. And then we were still able to save the bulk of the asset for the family members. So she only had to spend for a temporary period of time. And then sometimes they can, if you're a veteran, you can qualify for the VA aid and attendance program, which that can help to pay your daily rate when you go into a Medicaid facility as well. So there's a lot of different pay sources that we can use to help with spending down the money as well as using the annuities. Shall we talk about, um, we have a question from Melissa. Do we want to, uh, to address that now? Uh, um, because she's asking okay. about uh, Medicaid can cover in-home care to, uh, says to the extent preferences to keep the person at home for as long as possible because it's more cost effective. Well, there is, a community-based program, but right now there's 20,000 people on the waiting list. So you have to be on the waiting list several years. Sometimes it's five or six years to be able to um, 
to get that program. What is possible though, they have to meet medical necessity. They have to have the medical need to be in a nursing home before they can qualify. But if they will go into the nursing facility, qualify for Medicaid, then if it's more cost effective for them to return home and get care, then that's a possibility. But you otherwise you have to uh, be on the waiting list. You can bypass that waiting list by going in, getting the Medicaid certified, and then you work with the social worker there at the facility. And if you qualify to go home and get the care, you can do it in that respect. Lisa, you mentioned the, the requirements to, uh, to be admitted to a, a full skilled nursing facility. And I, I wanna touch on that for just a second and ask you, um, there certainly are monetary requirements and, and that's where we come in with legal planning and, and arranging mm -hmm. so that people can uh, keep as many of their assets as possible. But what about the physical requirements? Typically, what is it? I, I know that's a medical decision, not a legal one, but uh, what generally would qualify a person medically to, to get on Medicaid? Um, I don't do those assessments. <laughs> Yeah. You can, if you're wondering, your doctor can give you a, a pretty good idea if they're going to meet the medical requirements. And, uh, and if you're looking for a facility, they can do an assessment to be sure that your family member does meet the medical requirements because you can't use a Medicaid facility for a retirement home. You've got to have a medical need to qualify for that. And that is something, unfortunately, that I can't do for you. I cannot uh, help you. I can help you with knowing if you can't, uh, if you're not ambulating, if you're not able to take your medications, or you're not able to, uh, to be able to have a, a medical assistant come to your house, which there are many programs that are, are structured by the state of Texas where you can indeed access uh, care in the home through those programs. Now, it's, it's probably going to be three times a week or something like that. It's not going to be even if you go to the Medicaid facility and you qualify and you return home, it is not going to be 24-hour care at home. It will never be that. You can have uh, personal assistance in the home. You can... Uh, um, have a nurse that will come by, but they're not going to be everyday occurrences. So, you know, that uh, as well, your family is going to have to help out in those situations. So be, be aware that those are, uh, are only going to be available if the, if the one you're caring for has to have some abilities, like the ability to get out of the house in case there's a fire or something. They have to meet a lot of requirements to be safe at home. And that is one of the things. If they're not safe at home, then you need to examine the Medicaid program to help out with their care. Vici, I, I know a common question that we'll get uh, from people. If, if they have a loved one who's not ambulatory, uh, that, that kind of speaks for itself. It's very obvious. Uh, but we get people who ask us about, they'll say, look, my, my mom or my dad uh, is suffering from dementia. And what they really need is some type of memory care. Uh, is, can somebody who, who is suffering from that type of, uh, uh, of situation qualify under Medicaid? Um, many times they can. Um, like I say, I don't do the assessments. If they're not safe at home, you know, if they don't realize they've turned the gas on in the house and, and maybe the, the fire didn't light, you know, that is certainly a safety problem and that needs to be addressed and that can certainly help them to qualify for Medicaid. Alzheimer's in itself um, or dementia use to have more credibility in the Medicaid system for meeting the medical requirements than it does currently. Um, you still can meet that eligibility, like I say, if they're not gonna be safe at home. 
So be aware that, uh, that you need to have that assessment done to be sure that your family member can get the care they need. And either, you know, there is a, a community attendant program that you can access, but they already have to be below the, the required uh, amount on their uh, assets. So if it's an individual and they live alone and they need someone to come in and help them with bathing and dressing and that sort of thing, then there is a program. You just dial the, uh, the 211 and tell them that you need that program for your family member and they will come out and do an assessment and they will can also hook them up with a, uh, the emergency response button, Meals on Wheels. There's a lot of other things that they can help them out with. So, um, you know, you, you can get a lot of things, but you have to meet the, the requirements to begin with. And there's not, uh, they're not, they don't have the same accessibility on making transfers, so okay. some of them you can make a transfer and be eligible the next month on. I'm sorry, I've got a gnat in my face. <laughs> it's driving me crazy. <laughs> um, so, BC, another question that we get quite frequently is uh, whenever people are searching for uh, a Medicaid bed, and, and we, I've, heard, I've heard you tell many people over the years that uh, before, we can, uh, before you can apply for Medicaid, you actually have to be in a Medicaid bed. But the first question many people will have is, so where do I go to look for a Medicaid bed? It, it, do, does every nursing facility around have Medicaid beds or only some of them, or how does that work? Well, many do. And, and sometimes they have a limited number. So, and some of them actually have what's called a spin down bed. So you might have to pay for your care for a while before they have a, a Medicaid bed for you. Uh, those are, are less frequent. Most of your skilled nursing facilities, and you wanna get one that's in the community where you live. So it's gonna be convenient for your family members to to be able to see you on a regular basis, just call and ask. Just call them and, and go by there. And, and I say drop in and see what you think about it. Uh, COVID has, has kept us from being able to do that. But you can call and take a virtual tour. You can talk to the staff there. And, uh, and they can, with the clinicals for your family members, many times they can establish the eligibility medically uh, from those uh, medical records. And, uh, and then sometimes they will come out and do an assessment on your family member. So just call around. Most, most of your skilled nursing facilities have Medicaid beds. Some have a limited number and sometimes they're just full. Sometimes they're, you know, that particular one may not have any beds at all and have a waiting list. So just call around and see, or, or if you can show up and take a tour, you know, it's wonderful to, to know in advance where your family member is going to reside and see if that <clears throat> is going to meet the requirements for you. Ask questions, get that warm, fuzzy feeling, and you'll know you're in the right place. One of, one of the myths that come up quite frequently, um, people will ask us, they'll say, look, if, if my loved one's in a Medicaid bed, are they gonna receive some lesser care than they would if we paid out of pocket? Uh, that, I think that's a good one yeah. to, to ask. Yeah, and, and for what it's worth, you have many, many, many CNAs that work in these, these uh, facilities and they don't have a clue who pays for your care, whether you're getting Medicaid assistance, whether you're private paying or what. They treat everyone the same. They don't care, they don't have a, a they're not on a need to know and, and would never, that would never be information that was privy to them. So um, the thought that they're gonna get better care if they're privately paying is certainly a myth, is certainly a myth. If a person is on Medicaid BC, um, talk, talk about this just a little bit. We, we tell people, look, if you 
preserve the assets in a trust and get on Medicaid, you can utilize the money that you've saved, maybe even to upgrade, uh, you get a private room or Absolutely. something for them. Yes, Medicaid handbook allows for the family to make the difference in payment for um, Medicaid provides only for a double room where you have a, a friend in there. Some facilities have individual rooms, but if you are in one, your family members in one that has double rooms and you want them to have a single room, then Medicaid does allow the family to pay the difference. You can pay it directly. You cannot pay it to your family members. You have to pay it directly to the facility, but that's certainly allowable. Okay. Um, so if you want, if that's important to you. Also, if their doctor can order, if, uh, you know, a single room as well. So medical necessity would have to, uh, to approve that as well to have them in a single room rather than a, a double occupied room. So, you know, there's a couple of ways to do that. I don't know, I don't know if this is a myth, but we certainly get asked this question a lot. I, I definitely wanna address it. Um, you touched on briefly earlier VA benefits. Sometimes people will, will be in a situation where maybe they're in assisted living or maybe not and, and receiving some type of benefits either from VA or, or somewhere else. Um, some type of military retirement, even, even the question about social security. If I get on Medicaid, does that cancel out my social security? How does Medicaid interplay with these other benefits that people may be receiving? Well, that's an interesting concept because uh, there are some programs like the VA Aid and Attendance Program that is called a needs-based program. And when it's a needs-based program, then it's not countable towards your payment. Otherwise, all of your income, whether it's your retirement from your work, if, uh, if you have income from uh, Social Security, your retirement, all of that goes towards your payment for your care in the facility. So whether you got only a $500 check from, from your uh, deceased spouse or whether you have five or $6,000 a month in income, you're still required to pay all of your income for your care. And if you happen to have a long-term uh, long care policy, uh, some of the old ones only paid a specified amount and you can still, you may still need to get on Medicaid to have enough money to pay for your care. So you can get on Medicaid, but your uh, long-term care policy payment would still go towards your care. Okay, I've, so, I've got two, two questions regarding income since we're on this topic. And, and the first one deals with, uh, in my opening scenario, I had a married couple that had about $500,000. And mm -hmm. if one of the couples needs to get on Medicaid, now we know that the community spouse, the one who's not getting on Medicaid needs money and income to live. Uh, where does that come from if we're, if we're taking the, the income from the individual who needs to get on Medicaid? Well, what are they allowed also, to have? So they, they can have any amount that comes in but like say the spouse that only was getting $500 a month is the one that's living at home, then the, the state allows us to increase that from the spouse's income up to $3,259. So they can get deferred uh, the income from the institutionalized spouse. So if the one that got the most money is the patient for Medicaid, they can still divert their income to their community spouse. So that's real important to know. Now, if the total income between the two of them is $2,500 a month, then the spouse that stays at home would get all of that $2,500. And the one in the facility would have a payment of zero. 
Okay, that leads me to the next income question, which is there is a limit on how much income that, that you can have uh, with Medicaid. And if you exceed that amount of income, uh, then the, the Medicaid requires you to set up a, a QIT or qualified, qualified income trust. Uh, tell us a little bit about that scenario and how all of that works. I, some people get really confused about, about that okay. question. Right now, the income cap for an individual is $2,382 a month. But if you got $2,383 a month, you still won't have enough money to pay for your care. So there is a way to bypass the income requirement. And that uh, Keith can uh, do the legal document for you to put that into an income trust. And it doesn't really meet the guidelines for a trust because it doesn't have a corpus. It's just nothing more than a special bank account and it, the money goes in and then it, it makes you become eligible by placing that money into this account and then you take it right back out and pay it for your care. So it's a very easy process, but the federal guidelines are the ones that come up with the income caps. So they are far reaching from the cost of care. So there has to be a way around that. And there certainly is, and we're certainly ready to help you with that. And just, just to clarify, because we brought up two different kinds of trusts, and I want, I want everybody to be really clear that these, these are two different um, entities that, that have, serve a different purpose. Um, the, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust or ir Irrevocable Trust is uh, something that we set up in order to preserve the nest egg, if you will. Um, and, and money is put in that irrevocable trust. Uh, a trustee is chosen. Most of the time, people will choose um, you know, the child that's been taking care of them the most or, or the one that they believe would handle the money in the best way. And that, that trust does have, uh, VC used the word corpus. That means it, it has... Uh, uh, bulk to it. There's there's something in that account, and it's growing and, and investing and all that. The the QIT, the Qualified Income Trust, is for income, not for assets. Two different things, and it's just for money to pass through each month. So you could call it a pass through trust instead of one that you're trying to build, and it just deals with the monthly income. Um, so a big thing that we talk to people, one of, one of the biggest questions when people come in and they say, look, we're beginning the process of preparing for Medicaid, we will ask them, do you currently own a house? And what is your plan for that house? Because we do not want to create a scenario, as long as the house is a house, it is an exempt asset. As soon as you decide to sell that house, it becomes a big pile of money and Medicaid will look at it completely differently. It's no longer exempt. The scenario that we do not want to have happen is for somebody to get on Medicaid, they have an exempt house, and then they sell the house, turn it into a pile of money, and Medicaid now says, you don't qualify anymore because you have too much money that's not protected or preserved in a trust, and then they kick you off of Medicaid. Uh, so, there is a, uh, I, I frequently will ask people when we do seminars, um, like live, I'll say, who's, who's ever heard of a ladybird deed? Raise your hand. And it's, it's not very common that we get somebody who raises their hand. But I want to tell you about ladybird deeds, because ladybird deeds can play a crucial role. If a person comes to us and they say, that, look, we are about to sell the house and move into assisted living, or um, then we'll tell them, go ahead and sell the house and then we'll put the money into a trust. If they say, look, I'm, I need to get on Medicaid, but my spouse wants to stay in that house. The, our question is, is your spouse planning on always staying in that house? Um, we could transfer, there's several things that we can do. We could transfer ownership of the spouse who's going on Medicaid in the house over to the spouse who's staying in the house. You do that through a special warranty deed. Um, or we tell them, look, you, you may 
be in a situation where you need to commit to keeping that house until uh, until death so that you don't get somebody kicked off of Medicaid. But um, the biggest issue, and back to the ladybird deeds, Medicaid will let you get on Medicaid while you own a house, but down there buried in the fine print is something called the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program, or MERP for short, M-E-R-P, MERP. This is a surprise that you don't wanna have happen, and, and you can plan around it if you're aware that it exists. But sometimes we'll hear about people who didn't know, and so they get on Medicaid, and they own a house, and then at some point they pass away, and their loved ones go to probate their will, and Merp shows up in probate court and puts a lien against that real estate for the amount that they paid out in Medicaid benefits. And that's a big shock because if somebody's got a $300,000 house that they wanted to leave to their kids uh, and they go to probate it and Merp shows up and slaps a $135,000 lien against the house, uh, it's a huge surprise. The good news is that Texas is very much a state that believes a person's home is their castle. And so Texas is one of the states that allows ladybird deeds. And this is the way that a ladybird deed works. When you sign a ladybird deed, you designate who you want to inherit your ownership in that real estate upon your death. And from a, from a legal perspective, that transfer, you sign the deed, you file it with the county clerk's office where the real estate is located. And it sits there dormant for the rest of your life. And when you die, if you still own that real estate, from a legal perspective, the transfer to your beneficiaries happens one second after you take your last breath on this earth. Now, in, in reality, probably takes about 30 days because you have to go down to the county clerk's office with a death certificate. It, it can take 30 days to get a death certificate. But the effect that it has is that it removes this real estate from your probate estate. So if there's a need to probate your will, uh, Merck cannot attach a lien against that property because it has already been removed from your estate. And very often when we're doing live seminars in person, someone will raise their hand in the back and say, well, that sounds like a pretty neat trick and pretty slick and uh, is, is this legal? And the answer is absolutely it's legal. Lady Bird deeds have been around since the 1970s uh, and the Texas legislature liked Lady Bird deeds so much that Lady Bird deeds are what we call common law, meaning that they just appeared one day uh, out of nowhere and then somebody challenged it in court and all the judges upheld it. And so it's been recognized since the 1970s. But in about 2015, I believe it was, our legislature here in Texas decided to create their own version of a Lady Bird deed. Now they call it a transfer on death deed or Todd for short. Um, it works very much the same way that a ladybird deed does. Now old school attorneys such as myself still rely upon ladybird deeds because they're, they're more established. There hasn't been a whole lot of case law with the transfer on death deeds, but the, our, our legislature actually codified and made, um, put it in the statutes. That, that we allow for this, this transfer, immediate transfer of real estate upon death to avoid probate and to avoid um, the Medicaid estate recovery program. So. Um, oh, yes. So we, we frequently um, will help a, people put together the ladybird deeds as well. Yes, there is a limit on your home value for an individual, it's $595,000. If your home is worth more than that, then you have to like get a, get a one of those uh, reverse mortgages to where your equity is less than 595,000 for it to be an exempt asset. Now we've got some questions over here. Um, Faith apparently, um, thinks that you have to pay all your income for your care. There is an, um, a personal needs amount of $60 that each individual gets to keep. You also get 
to deduct the cost of your health insurance, your um, Medicare supplement, and uh, in your dental expense, if you're paying for a dental plan. So essentially you pay all your money for your care, but you do get to keep $60 monthly, and which isn't a, a lot. That's another reason it's good to kind of be able to save some of mom's money. And then the things that she needs extra, you can kick, the, kick in some extra to help with, uh, with those needs. Um, also, someone had asked about the qualifying Medicare beneficiary or the QMB program, and that is not a Medicaid program, that's qualifying Medicare beneficiaries. And low-income people can qualify for extra help. And that's all that is, is that, and it's an excellent program if you qualify for it, because the QMB is actually a Medicaid, Medicare supplement, which Medicaid uh, will pay the difference in your costs of care, but ideally Medicare pays 80% of your medical expenses. So you've got a deductibles and you've got your 20% uh, copay that you're responsible for. And that's what the QMB does, is it, it provides like a Medicare supplement for low-income people that will help with the payment of those extra Medicare uh, covered um, programs and it costs and expenses. And uh, someone also asked about if you suddenly inherit money while you're on Medicaid. If that money is, uh, is, in, is left to you and not to your trust, if you think Aunt Sue is planning to leave you all her worldly assets and they were significant, I suggest you set up a trust and, uh, and Aunt Sue can leave the money to your trust, otherwise it is yours. And you do have to, <laughs> excuse me, you do have to, um, it would make you ineligible for a month, the month of receipt of this inheritance and then if you uh, if we're working with you to to be able to put that into an irrevocable trust then we might have to pay for your care for a while but you would still be on medicaid it's not going to invalidate your medicaid if you know what to do is to call us and we'll take care of it for you <coughs> and uh, but we would save usually we can save like 60 Excuse me, 60%. I'm going to leave and get a drink of water. Okay. Um, <laughs> Be right so back. <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address a few of these questions here while you're getting a drink, BC. Um, there was a second part of that last question where somebody asked, uh, is there a maximum amount you can have in savings to qualify uh, under Medicaid? And uh, that's where the, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust or Irrevocable Trust comes in. Uh, I don't know, VC. maybe you can still hear me. If there's a maximum that you've ever heard of, uh, please let us know. But to my knowledge, there's not a maximum amount that you can preserve. We've, we've had people with substantial assets um, come in and set up a trust and uh, we're able to preserve those assets either 100% if they, if they come to us five years before they need Medicaid or at least... Uh, right around 60% of it uh, if, if they can't make it all five years. So, um, so VC, you're, you're back just, to, just a yes or no. Have you ever heard of a maximum amount that you can put into a trust to preserve? Excuse me? I, I was just asking if, if you had ever heard, is, is there a maximum amount of money that you could put into a trust to preserve? Is it possible for somebody to have so many assets that we could not create a trust and, and protect and preserve those assets? None that I've ever come across. Okay, okay. Just, just making sure. Um, I, you and I have never had that discussion before. I don't, I don't know yeah. if I've ever asked you that, but I've never heard of it either, so. No, um, sometimes when you have an individual that's disabled, 
you know, and, and frequently that's like a disabled child that maybe they were born with a disability and uh, the family has cared for them their entire life, but they have a longer life than the rest of the family. And uh, in those situations, sometimes the family sets up a trust for them, a special needs trust or, or any type of trust. <clears throat> and they can actually um, be able to be on Medicaid as well and have a trust. So uh, if everything is done correctly, and that would be a third party trust where the money was not given to them directly, but set up in a trust for them, if the trust provides for them to be able to uh, not access the money and to receive public benefits, then typically it doesn't matter. And some of those trusts have a lot of money in there. Yeah. Um, it can be in the millions. Uh -huh. So we have a question from Andrea. Um, and I, I think that probably it needs to be answered in two parts. So I'm gonna take the first part of it and then, and then ask you BC to, to address the second part. But she says, um, her mom is, is uh, apparently has low assets. Uh, to where we're not worried about pr pr protecting and preserving assets. Uh, and she says, would we still need to work with the attorney's office uh, to get her uh, on Medicaid? And, and the first part of that question I want to address with, uh, it's always wise uh, if you're doing any long-term estate planning to come in and let us look at the legal documents that are in place. Uh, we see people frequently who have their, their legal documents are not sufficient for their needs and, and they're not aware of it. Um, you know, whether it's the, the powers of attorney may need to be updated. Uh, powers of attorney, especially the durable power of attorney that deals with finances in Texas has undergone many as four or five different uh, changes over the last 20 years. And sometimes people may have a durable power of attorney that either they had it done 15 years ago, or even if they had it done you know, fairly recently in the last handful of years, the person who prepared it was still using an old format. The newest format for the durable power of attorney has a lot more authority to, for the agent to do what's necessary to get the government programs uh, financially for their loved one. Uh, and we can, we can make that assessment and tell people if their legal documents um, that they have in place are going to be sufficient or not. The second thing is, is if we have a married couple, and let's say that the that the husband is going to need to get on Medicaid clearly uh, sooner than than the wife, um, we we would want to address the situation if they have wills. If the husband, it's so common that when people get their wills put together for husband and wife, they'll say, "I leave everything to my spouse," and if my spouse dies before me then split it between my kids. Almost 95% of the wills we draft are like that. But if the husband is going to get on Medicaid, uh, we don't want the wife's will to leave everything to the husband anymore because he could get on Medicaid, then something could happen to her where she suddenly dies. He inherits all of her estate and now he's ineligible for Medicaid. So we wanna look at the big picture to make sure that there's, that there's no surprises. So I think there's value uh, in, in coming in, let us look at your documents, tell you what, where you are and, and you know, if there's any concerns that we might have and need to address now, especially, especially if we are dealing with somebody who's been diagnosed with dementia uh, because uh, dementia and Alzheimer's can be very tricky. I went to a seminar a few years ago where the speaker explained that you don't know some people reach a certain level of cognitive ability and they never go below that. Other people, it's kind of a long, slow, steady decline and with others, it's stair-stepped. And so to me, from a legal perspective, that means that there is a window of opportunity for that individual to be legally competent to sign legal documents. And if we get beyond that point where they can no longer sign legal documents or correct or do an amended durable power of attorney, the, the only other recourse would be guardianship. And guardianship um, is very expensive, very time consuming, uh, something that you know, most people would want to avoid if they could, if they had their powers of attorney in place. So, uh, so yes, always, I, I think it's always beneficial to come in and at least let us assess your situation. We don't charge 
to, uh, to meet with people and kind of give them that assessment. Um, but the second part of the question, uh, VC, is if a person yeah. is not worried about preserving assets, is it still worth it uh, to work with an attorney's office to try to qualify for Medicaid? But my short answer, and then I'm going to hand it to you, is there are so <laughs> many things you don't know what you don't know. And there are so many things that, that there's just no way to, for you to get up to speed in time if this is not something that you do on a daily basis. Yes, the application in itself is a 19 page um, application. And that's the new simplified one. And uh, it is just personal information. You can fill that out. Uh, just remember that uh, you must and, and, and there again, it helps to chat with us that you report everything accurately because when you sign that application, that's your statement that all that information is true and you don't want to commit fraud. So we'd love to help you go through it. Now, most of your nursing homes take it upon themselves to complete that information for you. Um, it is illegal. It's a, a federal crime for them to apply for a program that they're the payee on. They seem to shun that, uh, that requirement. So it's up to you whether you want to accept their assistance with it. Just remember it. They keep an a copy of your application and if it has all of your pertinent information on it. So if you want to, to let them help you, they will, but they want to keep the application in their uh, in their files. You don't know who looks at it. If someone steals mom's uh, social security number or bank account numbers or any of her other pertinent information, um, uh, I don't recommend it. I'll just put it that way. I'll be glad to help you with filling in the, the blanks and getting together. I'll tell you what you need to provide for them to make the decision you can certainly do it directly. And, uh, and those clients that opt to uh, have us assist them, you know, uh, we certainly are bound to confidentiality in everything that we do. And uh, it will, will never be breached in our office. Uh, you, don't, uh, you don't have to do that. You can do it yourself or I'll help you fill it out and you can keep it at home, your coffee at home by yourself. And uh, you, it, it does help you to um, have the, the legal responsibility to be able to fill that out. Now, the state of Texas doesn't require that you have a power of attorney, but keep in mind, if you're not on all of mom's bank accounts, you don't know all of her life insurance policies, there can be other assets that you may not think are gonna count towards mom's $2,000 limit. So, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's free for you to visit with us. We'd love to be, meet with you and help you get everything laid out. Maybe she has $10,000 right now. And we can also uh, help you to be able to keep part of that, get mom eligible anyway. And then if she needs some extra funds, you've got those there to help out. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really think most of you can fill out the information accurately, but if, you, if it looks a bit imposing, it is. But, uh, but just be sure that you address everything and, and have the big picture, because a lot of times uh, our seniors were so diligent in, in buying little life insurance policies, and sometimes they had five or six, and many of them, you know, have reached their face value by this time, and that can put them over the resource limit. Sometimes we need to liquidate those and maybe buy a pre need funeral contract with the, the proceeds from that, and then you can become eligible again. So it's, uh, it's a lot of details, and it is incredibly complicated. So, uh, like I say, it's, it's just a phone call away. If you want to chop, just tap, chat with me about it, and I'll help you with uh, getting all the information together and you can feel confident in filling that out yourself. Or if you want to meet with us and, uh, and have Keith to look at 
at your current legal documents. He'll always do that for free and make recommendations. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a real easy way to, to get confident in what you're doing. Okay. They say that we've got, before I forget the one I've, I've been holding um, in my head, a uh, common question is, how long does the Medicaid application process take? And, and during the assessment period, will, will Medicaid pay back? Um, you know, for, for if, if it takes them three months to make a decision, will they pay those three months that you were waiting? How does that work? Um, the state legal requirements are that they, uh, that they process the application on by the 45th day. So if you're, newly going in there and you meet the eligibility requirements on the first day of the month, then everything is good and they'll go back and pay to the first day of the month that you entered. Sometimes we're looking at doing spin downs and, and we always look at the calendar on that. Let's get the money spent down before the end of the month so that you can go in on the first and Medicaid will start right then or go in on the last day of the month and look at the first for your date and then everything will start then. So it, it just helps to chat with us and let's have the picture of, of, of your situation. And uh, you know, and even if, if your family member doesn't have assets, um, we still need to look at the income and be sure the income is below the cap as well. Okay. And um, someone was asking about asset limits on the QMB program, and it's a little bit over 7,000 at this time, since I, I don't frequently do that, give advice on the QMB program anymore. It usually it's called extra help and the IRS usually contacts you about that. So um, it, but the, as well as I remember the asset limit on the QMB is 7,000. Okay. Um, we had somebody here, uh, Karen, who, who said, she started to ask a question and we got part of it and then we didn't get the rest of it. Retype in your question. Uh, you started to ask about a neighbor um, something, and then then your um, your question Is cuts it, off. Did it go down? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the contact information there. I just put in that somebody had asked about, uh -huh. and um, okay. I don't see any other new questions at the moment, um, and I've gone through my list of questions that I was gonna. <laughs> make sure to cover. Um, anything else, VC, that stands out to you? I, I know that we, um, we, we frequently will have people come in and they've heard something from a neighbor or from a friend or they, they've Google searched all of this and sometimes they have part of it right and other times they're, they're, you know, they're confused about it. Um, it's a lot to know. And it's a, it's a lot to try to process and understand. And I, I guess the overall message we would give people is there there is a resource that you can that you can utilize. And and we're happy to meet with uh, or talk to anybody at any time to answer questions. The the Medicaid process is very specific and very individual. So we would ask you questions about you know does the individual or individual seeking Medicaid do they own a house? What's their plan for the house? Do they have legal documents? What's their income? What are their asset levels? So uh, we could actually put it all on paper and make a plan uh, for people. Um, and you know, that's the the other part of our team we didn't mention. Um, we didn't want we we never want to create a long term financial plan for somebody without an idea that once you put the money into the trust. Um, you want that money to grow and you want to do the right things tax wise to minimize the tax footprint of the money in that trust. So we, we have a third member of our, of our team that we work with. Now, he's not a member of our law firm, but it is a, a, a financial planner that we've uh, worked very closely with for the last uh, five or six years. 
who also, from working with us, understands the Medicaid process. So we, we never wanted to just turn somebody over and say, well, you got the money in the trust, good luck, go find, a, go find your own financial planner who can figure this out. We've actually got somebody that we utilize um, who, who knows how all of this works to make that money grow and last as long as possible. Yes, and he's uh, and he can help you with understanding how the uh, um, the tax implications of having a trust in that sort of thing as well. Okay. Uh, okay. So we got we got Karen typed in her question. She says uh, QMB recipient just paid off the house, so it no longer has that expense, but income is low at eight hundred dollars per month. Will they lose help now that they lost the large house expense? Any way to work around the lost expense as a lot of no. expenses to stay in the house? Now, the home is, is an exempt asset on the QMB, just like it is on Medicaid. So that has no, um, and, and, it's, and it's not a, uh, it, it's not a factor in figuring that in. You have to be below 7,000 on non-exempt assets on the QMB, but the home is always exempt on all the, our programs. So it doesn't matter whether the house is paid off or not. So that is, uh, that is not part of the QMB. The QMB is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't keep up with that and I should have had my, I thought I had my little guide here, but in I may, let me see if I find it here, that outlines, uh, that while while you're looking um, BC, i just i also wanted to say let's um, see. now this is just uh, just the programs that are available for people in the community for low-income individuals um i say in in low income is like if you're under 900 dollars, like the qmb rate there's a lot of programs that are available to you you can always dial 211 and someone should come out and do an assessment to see if you need a a caretaker, if you need uh, meals on wheels, if you need an emergency response button. And those things are free to you. All of those programs that the state provides are free to you. You do have to pay when you're on the Medicaid program, you do have to pay a part of that. But all those other programs, if you qualify for those, and most of them have the, uh, for the uh, caretaker and all of that, those, uh, those have the same income limits as the Medicaid, you know, the 23, uh, the 2382 monthly. So a lot of people can qualify for the, you know, the assistance at home or with the housekeeping and that sort of thing. Sometimes they get meal preparation. Um, I always worked in the financial side of that program, so I can't go into detail, but sometimes it also provides for home modifications. And that's real important to a large population. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, just give us a call, dial 211, and have someone come out and, and do an assessment on you and your situation and see what you can, uh, what they can assist you with, because those funds are there for our, uh, our disabled population, whether you're a, a senior or not. And, uh, and, and they're very, very beneficial, very beneficial, and they're at no cost to you. We've had two more questions pop up, BC. I'll take the first one. It's a legal question, which is, uh, uh -huh. is, a war is a warranty deed reserving life estate the same as a ladybird deed? The answer is yes. Um, ladybird deed is sort of the street name. Uh, instead of saying special warranty deed reserving enhanced life estate, which is a mouthful, uh, ladybird deed just sounds better. Um, the other question is, should a QMB recipient apply for Medicaid if she needs in-home help? No, that's not going to be. We, you can get on the waiting list for the at-home Medicaid if you qualify. Um, because like I say, it's going to be years unless you bypass that by going into a facility. So if you want, if, if you're having medical issues now and you know you want to stay at home, Go ahead and get your name on the list mm -hmm. and, uh, and be assessed because there's maybe some things that you can qualify for now at home. Okay. I know that, um, I know that uh, Natalie's recording this uh, for, for future 
uh, viewing by by an audience. Um, and I don't know when you record these Zoom, I've never asked if the chat questions and everything and answers uh, are a part of that naturally or not. So just for the record, don't have access to the chat. Um, the way that you can reach us, uh, our law firm is called Barnett and Ludy PC. We're located in Northwest Austin, kind of just north of the Arboretum area. Um, our main number here is 512-336-1529. That's 512-336-1529 if you want to schedule an appointment uh, to come in and, and have a sit down discussion. Um, also, uh, VC uh, has a direct line that you can reach her at. I, I always tease her that she never sleeps. She's taking calls into the evening sometimes, <laughs> uh, but she'll answer the phone to, to either answer your questions directly, or you could also call and talk to her and then schedule an appointment through her as well. Uh, VC's direct line is 512-229-6561. That's 512-229-6561. And we're happy to visit with you, answer any questions that you have and, and make an assessment, let you know, you know where you are with your legal documents and how to get from point A to point B. Um, you know, anytime, just let us know how we can help. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and just to let everyone know on Monday, you will receive the recording. You will receive MVC and Keith's contact information, um, as well as age of Central Texas information. Um, and then you will also receive a survey because we wanna hear uh, your feedback. And we also would love to hear what you would like to learn about in the future. So thank you so much, Keith and VC. That, is, that was a lot of information. Um, and is. I will, yes, but it's, it's so helpful and it's so wonderful to know that we have you both in the community to, to assist um, individuals and families through this very complicated process. So um, it's really, it's really nice to know that you're there to help. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you. Our pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us this morning again. Um, have a wonderful weekend and, and keep it, just look out for the email with all of this information um, that'll be delivered to you on Monday. Thank you. Okay. Have a Thanks. great weekend. Bye. Bye.